Today we have Elizabeth Chu, and she became the CEO of the South Carolina Historical Society in January 2024. A historian, curator, and educator, she has worked at museums and historic sites since 1985. Prior to arriving in Charleston, she served as executive vice president and chief curator at James Madison's Montpelier in Virginia. During her eight and a half years at Montpelier, she led teams of curators, historians, educators, interpreters, public education, public program creators, archeologists, and historic preservation experts in researching and interpreting James Madison and his family, his essential roles in framing the U.S. Constitution and leading the nation and the community of enslaved people on the plantation. Prior to joining Montpelier, she led the curatorial and education division at Rinalda House Museum of American Art in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Earlier in her career, she served as curator at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello in Char Charlottesville, Virginia. During her 13-year tenure there, she was responsible for ongoing research and interpretation initiatives that wove together the Monticello House, its collections, the Jefferson family, and the enslaved community. She also worked in curatorial positions in art museums in Washington, D.C., at the Phillips Collection, the National Gallery of Art, and the Smithsonian American Art Museum. She was raised in Augusta, Georgia, and received her BA in Art History from Yale University, an MA from the University of London, and PhD from UNC Chapel Hill. And today, she's here to tell us how South Carolina history is American history. Thank you so much, Marion, and thanks to Walter and Abby for the wonderful welcome and lunch, and thanks to all of you for coming out today. Um, as Marion said, I'm, even though I grew up on the Savannah River, I am new to Charleston um, as of the last seven months. And, but, and, and one of the reasons that I wanted to take this job is because I'm so convinced that the history of South Carolina, for better and for worse, had a profound impact on the trajectory and story of our nation. So I want to tell you why I think that, but I'm going to start off by talking about the South Carolina Historical Society, which even though it was founded in 1855, many folks don't know about. So what are we? We are an archive, a research library, a museum, and a publisher of two magazines. As I said, founded in 1855, we are a nonprofit organization, which means that we receive no ongoing support from any government, local, state, or federal. So we're dependent on donors and fundraising. And our mission is to expand, preserve, and make accessible our important collection and to encourage interest in the rich history of our state. And we are a little confusing because our activities are divided between different places. So first of all, we, our headquarters and our museum are located at 100 Meeting Street in Charleston. This is just above the intersection of Meeting and Broad, right in downtown. And our building is a beautiful uh, building designed by South Carolina architect Robert Mills and completed in 1826. And it was not our original home, but we have been there since 1941. And inside the building, besides being a very cool building to see, it is, there's a wonderful exhibition on the history of South Carolina. And now, oh, and it only cost $1 to go in. So the next time you're all in Charleston, I strongly encourage you to come, to walk down Meeting Street and come see us in our beautiful building, which is right beside Washington Park which Robert Mills also designed as part of the um, building area. So it's a very beautiful part of downtown Charleston. Now, the, the rest of us, um, our, um, our collections are located, have been since 2016, at the Adelstone Library at the College of Charleston. So prior to 2015, our, our collections were all inside the building um, on Meeting Street, but they moved to the Adelstone Library, where there was going to be better climate control and storage conditions and access for users. So they've been there for almost 10 years. What we collect, we collect manuscripts, we co which is handwritten things. We correct, collect printed materials like rare books and pamphlets. 
and visual materials like photographs, drawings, sketches, sketchbooks, etc. And we also collect um, three-dimensional objects, but that, that's kind of the smallest part of our collection. So we have basically over 2 million documents, 18,000 maps, 90,000 published materials, 50,000 things in our vertical, uh, in our visual materials collection, and 6,500 vertical files. So we have a lot, a lot of pieces of paper, large and small, um, in our holdings. So they include the papers of many of the most prominent families of South Carolina, and I mean not just Charleston, but across the state, with all the, the familiar uh, last names that I'm sure you associate with South Carolina, like Lawrence, Pickens, or Lawrence, Pinckney, Drayton, Middleton, Alston, Rutledge, etc. So those include personal correspondence, business records, plantation records, family records, diaries, travel journals, wills, inventories, really any, any kind of piece of paper that people you know, produce in their lives and then saved in the past, we have. Um, we, are, we have things like regiment books that have firsthand accounts of Revolutionary War battles and Civil War battles. We have archives of many of um, uh, many um, companies and businesses and architects' offices and law firms. So a lot of things, you can learn a lot of things about South Carolina from the, from the two million plus pieces of paper in our archives. Who can use this? Absolutely anyone can use it. Who does use it? Well, the public, genealogists, historians, students, lawyers, business people, architects, designers, artists, journalists, authors, filmmakers. We have about 5,000 people who come in person to use our archives every year, and we, um, about 30% of them are genealogists. We have 2,000 more people who use it virtually via phone and email. So we do serve a lot of people, a lot of research queries. So a lot of articles, books, TV shows, movies, films, documentaries, art projects, a lot of things um, come, the, the stories come out of our archives. We also publish two um, magazines. We publish a little small uh, blue volume called the South Carolina Historical Magazine. That's been coming out since 1900, and that is more kind of scholarly in nature. And then we we published something called the Carolog, which is like a more popular magazine. And if you are, are a supporter of the um, society, you receive both of these um, in the mail um, four times a year um, each in, in the best years, sometimes fewer. Um, but we, we serve the entire state. So even though we are based in Charleston and our collection is in Charleston, we do things all over the whole state. So for example, and there's some um, brochures right over here on the table to my right, we host every year what we call the fall tour. And it's in a, it's in a different um, part of South Carolina every year. Last year it was in uh, Williamsburg County. Um, this year it's gonna be up in Cherokee County in Gaffney because we are featuring the American Revolutionary War battlefield at Calpins, but there are many other of things to see there as well that day. It's on Saturday, October 27th. We warmly invite all of you to join us. You can sign up with the brochure that's over there or our, on our website. Um, we also do um, talks like I'm doing right now. We do teacher seminars. We do um, K-12 programs. We, we really, I mean, we haven't been so good at being all, all over the state until maybe uh, the last uh, few years, but, but we're working to be kind of everywhere and to be visible around the state. Okay, so now I wanna talk about why I think South Carolina history is American history and how I think that, that, that events that happened here profoundly affected the course of the United States of America. So first of all, the, the, the area that became South Carolina was central to the geopolitical struggles between the, the different European countries during the Age of Discovery in the uh, 17th and 16th centuries. So as some, of, as some of you may know, 
uh, Santa Elena on present day Paris Island near Beaufort, the Marine training base, was the first sustained European colony in the US. It was a Spanish colony founded by the Spanish in 1566 after several earlier attempts. And this is actually a map of it that was drawn by a French artist who was with an earlier French attempt to colonize. But, but Santa Elena, present day Paris Island, was established by the Spanish and was a successful going concern. Where it was it used to be under the golf course on Paris Island, but they moved the golf course and now you can go and visit and see where the site was. And it's an absolutely breathtaking view from where the site was out, um, out into the marsh. And they have kind of a, a kind of a marker and some historic things to read. But it's a really beautiful site to visit. And what I think is so incredible, Santa Elena, the Spanish colony at Santa Elena did not fail. The Spanish chose to discontinue and burn it down. They chose to focus on their, their, um, their uh, settlement in St. Augustine, Florida. So they had the, all the colonists, the settlers in Santa Elena, you know, prepare to get on boats and then burn, burn the settlement down as they left. So um, when, you know, when a, a hundred years later, when the, the British King Charles II, who had just gotten back to the throne of England, um, after their civil war, decided that he was going to claim, um, you know, the what what became the Carolinas. He was making a very kind of aggressive political gesture to the King of Spain because Spain had claimed that land for more than 150 years. So, so Charles II was doing something really. I mean, it wasn't the Spanish land, but it wasn't his land either. And he was going to give it away to the so-called Lords Proprietors who had been his supporters in reclaiming the British throne after the interregnum. So there's some really significant questions that we can ask ourselves looking at, look, looking at the, the Santa Elena colony and then at what Charles II did. What if the Spanish had not deserted Santa Elena? Would Charles II have been able to grant land to the Lord's proprietors? Would we be speaking Spanish today? Would this, ha would this have developed as a Spanish you know, colonial um, project that, you know, and not British. So who knows, but it all happened in South Carolina. So, but as we know, the Lord's proprietors did settle, um, it, it, you know, in 1670, it took some time, but by the early 18th century, things are going pretty well, except that the people who were settled here in the colony of South Carolina thought the Lord's proprietors were terrible kind of governors, or they really weren't governors. They were, you know, n none of them ever came here. They were kind of absentee. So in, as you probably know, in 1719, a number of settlers rose up and said that they were, that they were, that, that, that the Lord's proprietors had un unhinged the frame of government and forfeited their right to the same. So this, this group of, you know, of, of um, sort of activist, forward-looking settlers threw off the Lord's proprietors and made sure that South Carolina became a royal colony. And once it did, and this is called the uh, Revolution of 1719, after this happened, and it was a royal colony and it was governed in a better way, the colony took off um, as... as um, Landowners figured out or imported um, people from, from Africa who they enslaved and figured out that, that they knew how to grow rice. And so with the knowledge of the enslaved Africans, um, the, South, you know, the, the rice um, production makes the colony become st very stable and very, very wealthy and very successful. And in 1774, nine of the 10 wealthiest people in British North America were South Carolinians. Charleston was the fourth largest city after uh, Boston, Philadelphia, and New York, and it was the wealthiest. So, you know, between becoming a royal colony after 1719 and the era of the revolution, the, the colony becomes 
incredibly wealthy and a very significant player in the world economy. So what if South Carolina had not become a royal colony? And what if the enslaved people who came to this area had not known how to grow rice? Would the colony and all of the British colonies in North America have been as successful overall? Would we be, would we be sitting here today? So, you know, once again, so many what ifs that are played out in South Carolina. Another one that I think is really significant is what's called the regulator movement. And y'all probably know that, you know, things are, things are kind of always centered around Charleston. Charleston is the colonial capital. All of the courts and government are located there. So when settlers start coming down the Great Wagon Road and settling in the upcountry, there's no kind of established rules or government or police or court system there. I mean, there's, it's all in Charleston, but, but it doesn't really impact out there. And so life there is very tough and really kind of violent. And in the later 1760s, a group of settlers who call themselves regulators <clears throat> sort of become these vigilantes. I mean, they, you know, they ironically become their vigilantes for peaceful government. <laughs> so they kind of have this uprising where they try to take matters into their own hands. And what they eventually do is to um, achieve representation in the state assembly in, or the um, colony assembly in Charleston. They're able to create um, some kind of um, police force or constabulary, a court system, and a ways of keeping order. And so seven circuit courts are created by the court in Charleston in 1769. And that helps things enormously um, you know, across the western part of the colony. What if the regulators had not challenged the disorder in the upcountry? Would, this, would the state have developed the way it did? And um, one of my very favorite events, because I didn't even know that, about this until it, I moved here in January, even though I grew up in Georgia, on June the 28th, 1776, so this is six days prior to the adoption of the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, a small group of fighters on Sullivan's Island, right off of Charleston, in a fort made of palmetto logs, basically fights off the British Army, Navy, sorry, the British Navy. So this fort is today called Fort Moultrie after the general who was leading the troops, but it was called Fort Sullivan then. And this, was, this is what, the, um, what Carolina Day commemorates. And that's, that's a big deal in Charleston. And it's, I think, not as well known outside of Charleston, but it's, it commemorates this incredible victory, um, you know, fighting off the, the, the most powerful Navy that the world, world had ever known from a small palmetto log fort and that's the reason that the, the palmetto tree is our state tree. Um, you know, th this was something that gave the, the, the colonies really the confidence to think that there's a possibility that they could actually defeat the British Army and Navy and win their freedom. So this, was, this event, coupled with the um, signing of the Declaration on July 4, 1776, were really, really, really important parts of winning our freedom. And this event happening in South Carolina is basically, I'm sure, or I think, unknown outside of South Carolina. And I think should be much, much better known. Um, and we, you know, in, in, I'm sure y'all probably know that the American Revolution was in fact, you know, won in the upcountry of South Carolina at the battles of Kings Mountain and Calpins. And I would say, I would, I would ask, why doesn't every American know this? Well, I think they used to. I think that until the third quarter to the end of the 19th century, Americans did know that. And I'm going to use Francis Marion to explain why I think that. So, um, so the revolution, as we know, ended in with the Treaty of Paris in 1783 or two, anyway. Um, and 50 years later, artists are still, people are still writing about it, artists are making paintings and other works of art about it. So these are three um, paintings by the um, South Carolina artist John um, Blake White 
that d uh, depict famous scenes from the revolution. The, the one I showed before of, of the Battle of Sullivan's Island was one of them. But here's Francis Marion asking the officer to share his meal, Sergeants Jasper and Newton rescuing prisoners, and Mrs. Mott asking them to, bl to burn her house down. Um, you know, these stories from the, fr from the war in South Carolina were still known nationally. Um, this is an artist named William Tiley Ranney, who was very, very well known back in the 19, or sorry, 1850s for painting these kind of large narrative or storytelling paintings. This is a very large painting of Francis Marion crossing the PD, painted in 1850. So we, here we have a painting of a Revolutionary War general on a boat crossing a river. Here's another painting of a Revolutionary War general on a boat crossing a river. And I would argue that at the time that these two paintings were made, they're 1850 and 51, Marion was not as famous as George Washington, I'll give you that, but these two, these, both of these events were very, very, very well-known events from the Revolution. People would not necessarily have thought of the story of Francis Marion and the story of Washington across the, the Delaware as being kind of co-equal, or they would have thought that. Um, the, I think these events would have been things that all Americans learned about in school, you know, 75 years after the Revolution. They would still have been thinking that and learning that. And this is the kind of evidence that kind of suggests that that is correct. So, some other ways that we know that Francis Marion was popular and well-known. So in 1809, um, a writer named Mason Weems, Parson Mason Weems, published a biography of Francis Marion. And he had previously published one about George Washington. So he, you know, he kind of saw them as being you know, on the same level. When those two paintings that I just showed you were, were finished, were painted, they were then engraved and made into prints, you know, pieces of paper with the image on it that, is, that are made in multiple copies. And these were sold by subscription, also just sold in print shops. And people could buy them like you might buy a poster today or a postcard that reminds you of a you know, famous event. You know, and by the time these prints came out, the battles were 70, 75 years previously. So people were buying prints about Francis Marion as they were buying prints about George Washington. They, they, they thought of these as being kind of two really important Revolutionary War stories. Courier and Ives, probably the most famous print producers ever in the history of the country, also made a print of, of Marion crossing the PD that, would have, that you know, regular people would have bought to keep in either an album in their house or maybe on their wall. Harper's Magazine, which was a, a extremely popular publication um, for Americans in the middle of the 19th century, also um, had illustrations of some of the most prominent stories about Francis Marion, the one about him having dinner, or inviting a British officer for dinner, and the one about him crossing the PD River, and that's kind of about his, you know, his ragtag band of guerrilla, um, guerrilla warfare fighters. A, an extremely important American poet named William Cullen Bryant in 1840, so this is 10 years prior to the art that I've been talking about, published a poem called The Song of Marion's Men. And it started off with, with the verse that, that says, our band is few, but true and tried, our leader frank and bold. The British soldier trembles when Marion's name is told. So in 1840, a national audience would have still known who Francis Marion was and would have you know, seen, having this poem be a nationally published poem would have seemed normal. In addition, many play, the Revolutionary War figure with the second highest number of places named after him after George Washington is Francis Marion. So it's 36 towns or cities, 18 counties, 16 townships, two naval warships, just on and on and on, lots and lots of things named for Francis Marion, not only in South Carolina, but all over the, all over the then country. So Marion was somebody who had really sort of pervade, you know, sort of pervaded the national consciousness 
in the same sentence or breath as George Washington. So, and we know that changed. Um, so it changed, I, th I think it changed um, as time went on, the Civil War came and went, the incredible kind of factional discord. And I think that the stories of the, Civil, of the revolution in the North kind of overtook the stories of the revolution in the South. And you know, they were not, they kind of fell out of textbooks, you know, kids didn't learn about them. And I think Frances Marion kind of suffered this reputation loss that, that Washington sort of took in, you know, and ran with. And so he, he was built up and Marion kind of was almost forgotten about. But obviously we know that, you know, many, many important things happened here. The battles that turned the tide were here. There were more skirmishes here than anywhere else in um, the country. You know, Sullivan's Island provided kind of the, you know, the first kind of shot of adrenaline that kept everything moving forward. And fortunately, as we approach the year 2026, we're, um, it's the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution. And there is a national movement to commemorate that. And in, in particular, in South Carolina, there is a very hardworking statewide um, commission. That, there's a commission appointed by Governor McMaster to promote and support commemorative activities of all kind about the revolution in South Carolina. And I think that this is South Carolina's chant, I really believe this, to, to really show the nation. I mean, they don't have to convince them because, it, I mean, they have to just show it because it has the benefit of being true, um, you know, what happened here and that, that what happened here was profoundly important and that we're really missing the story if we only focus on Concord and Lexington and Fort Ticonderoga and Brandywine and those kind of things. So, um, so hopefully that's going to be a really, you know, it's going to be a good moment for the country to learn, learn this exciting story. So moving forward on what happens in South Carolina and how important that is to history. So during the first, you know, several decades of the 19th century, when um, John C. Calhoun and others are sort of, you know, they're working as sort of um, nullification becomes this kind of huge movement uh, and kind of a state's rights um, expression of, of you know, um, state over federal government. And so, you know, the, the, uh, this work, I think, in the Congress towards nullification and state's rights some of that is what is fueling the interest in by 1850, I think, in the revolution and the moment when the nation was being formed and there was great unity and excitement because by the 1830s, people were, were worried about what might happen. And so, you know, again, John C. Calhoun, South Carolina, you know, this is an example of another way that we were really impactful in the course of the nation, then obviously secession probably the big one, the one that everybody thinks about when they think of South Carolina, they think about Fort Sumter and secession. Um, and again, you know, for better, for worse, for whatever, South Carolina was definitely the leader of this in this, you know, mo this kind of conflagration that profoundly affected the rest, you know, the course of history, at, you know, f from there on. So, I'm going to look now at Reconstruction, and I'm going to talk about some of the things that are probably known to most of you, but I don't think everybody realizes how, how Reconstruction actually worked in South Carolina at first. Then it was obviously sh you know, shut down, closed down, but really the way that things started, off, started to happen here are ways that we, ha you know, that we now think about things. I mean, we can credit South Carolina with things that we may not have ever thought about. So from the ruins in Columbia, um, the, um, the, 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 the new constitution of 1868 resulted in the first legislature in the country that, that was majority black. Um, that it was, um, USC became the first um, state-supported Southern University to fully integrate. This is a picture of Henry E. Hain, who was the first African-American student who went on to be active in state government. 
This is a man named Richard Greener. He was the first black Harvard graduate and the first black faculty member at USC. So in the first years of Reconstruction, there were you know, um, people, blacks made distinct advances in both education and in the, the state government of South Carolina. I mean, we know what happened later when, it, when things were kind of shut down, but there was really interesting things happened here. Um, this is a statue of Richard Greener that's on the Capitol grounds now at, um, in Columbia. Um, and arguably, some really important events that led to the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s um, uh, started here too. So this is a, a terrible story of a Sergeant Isaac Woodard. He's a, a black South Carolinian in uniform traveling home by bus um, from, the, from the World War II. It's 1946. He is literally on a bus in uniform coming home from World War II. And there's a debate about what actually happened, but he ended up getting in an altercation with the bus driver and as a result of a fight and an attack was blinded. Um, and it was blind for the rest of his life. And he, the people who attacked him were not convicted, but the publicity and the story around the trial is one of the things that led Harry Truman to um, desegregate the military. And um, one of the judges, I, I think it was, well, this is a judge named Way T's Waring, who was from Charleston. And I can't remember whether he was actually on the judge in the case, but as a result of what happened in the Sergeant Woodard trial, Wadey's wearing kind of um, uh, commits himself to working uh, towards integration. And he's instrumental in getting this case, Briggs v. Elliott, to be filed. And, um, Briggs v. Elliott was a case that <clears throat> originated in Summer Summerton in Clarendon County, South Carolina, filed in 1950 when a group of black parents sued the school board to end segregation. I mean, they were basically saying, these are our schools, these are the white schools, this is not equal. It may be separate, but it's not equal. And so this case, and they got um, uh, uh, Thurgood Marshall actually was part of the local case before, before this case becomes folded in to Brown v. Board. Um, so again, what happens in South Carolina leads, I mean, the, um, the Isaac Woodard case, as well as Briggs v. Elliott, are really important in the, uh, the path to desegregation of the military, of schools, and to major landmarks like um, the case of Brown v. Board in 1954. So one of the reasons that I wanted to move to South Carolina and have this job is that I think that the history of this state is incredibly not just fascinating, but so important, and it's so many points in history has really, you know, helped the country, you know, make a turn, sometimes for the worse, sometimes for the better. But it's always been an incredibly active and uh, um, rich and important story. And so I hope you all, I see you all here, you, you all are history fans, but I, my, one of my um, dreams is to make sure that every South Carolinian knows how critical the state story is to the story of the country. So thank you all, and I'm very happy to answer questions.